Shabbat Shalom. I got a phone call about a month ago from Rabbi Wright, and he asked me if I would speak tonight. I said, wow, what an honor. He said, no, I've asked about six or seven other people, and they all said no, and you were the last one on my list. First off, I'd like to thank Temple Emmanuel, and especially Rabbi Wright and Monica. Where are you? Where's Monica? Oh, wow, what a voice. For allowing the Jewish war veteran post 608 the opportunity to share in the Shabbos service for this Veterans Day, and especially allowing me to speak from the, to the congregation on the Bema tonight. I'll start off telling you a short story about one of my heroes. At the outset of World War II, as most men do in this period, he was waiting for his draft number to come up to be called to active duty. When that date finally did arrive, mid-1942, he dutifully reported to the induction station, completed his physical, and went home to get his affairs in order in anticipation of a letter from Uncle Sam. When the letter finally arrived, he was advised, and I quote, he was unfit for military service due to perforated eardrums. What a shock. He was knocked out of military service due to an injury while at Boy Scout camp as a teenager. Devastated by this response and the fact that all young men his age were reporting for military service, he promptly wrote a letter to President Franklin Roosevelt asking to be reconsidered for military service as he felt he had a, and I quote again, score to settle with Herr Hitler. I guess his request was granted as he soon got another letter from the War Department advising him to report to his local Selective Service Board for reexamination. Shortly after that, he was inducted, and within eight months or so, he was on a trip sh troop ship heading to the South Pacific Theater. You've heard the old phrase, be careful what you ask for, you may get it. He did. Life in the South Pacific was nothing like he had expected. No beautiful exotic dancing girls with grass skirts. No one serving you fa fancy mixed drinks with little umbrellas in them. No beautiful climate with hammocks and palm trees. Mostly jungle steaming hot weather, lots of rain, and the food they ate was produced by companies that had formerly manufactured dog food. Kind of reminds me of home. I'm glad my wife wasn't here to hear that. Life got really complicated quick. Although he was trained as a mechanic, his job title was about to change. Most of us are aware that Uncle Sam has a short clause he uses quite often when handing out jobs. No matter what your primary job is, your actual job is based on what the military refers to as the needs of the service. And the needs of the service at this time and place was for infantrymen. He was now in a strange land halfway around the world, and his new job was searching the jungles of New Guinea looking for Japs, who I might add were also looking for him. Mid-1944, while on patrol with a small recon unit on the island of Bayak, just off the northwestern coastline of New Guinea, he and his man, men ran into a much larger Japanese unit. Surprise contact resulted between the two units. The much larger Japanese forces immediately began attempting to move into a position to flank the smaller American unit. After the better part of a day of vicious fighting, as the Japanese began to encircle them, pinning down the smaller American unit, the Americans began to run low on ammo. Things were starting to look bleak. No reinforcements were close by. Radio contact was sketchy. No air support. And their water was starting to run low. He then took it upon himself to make a bold move. Picked up a flamethrower, moved out from under cover, 
braving the withering enemy fire and charged the first machine gun, enemy machine gun bunker, engulfing it with napalm-like fire, killing all inside the bunker. He then moved to the second bunker, repeating the same procedure with the same results. His unit, realizing what he was doing, began to give him covering fire, helping to keep the Japanese from delivering any accurate fire. Doing this action, he was wounded twice and later had to be evacuated to a field hospital, but only after making sure his men were all okay. The results of this action were demoralizing to the Japanese and opened a gap in the enemy lines, giving the Americans the opportunity to effect a counterattack. At this point, the Japs were without machine gun cover, their command structure was in disarray, and the individual Japanese soldier began to beat a hasty retreat. This action no doubt saved American lives and allowed these American soldiers to fight another day. The story, this story of unbridled courage was not unlike many other stories from many other GIs throughout the South Pacific and the European theater of operation. Admiral Chester Nimitz, commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet during World War II, said it best shortly after the Battle of Iwo Jima. And I quote again, uncommon valor was a common virtue. It was actions like this that were performed by citizen soldiers who felt it was their duty to fight off fascism, totalitarianism, Nazism, and all other forms of repressive government who were trying to stifle our individual freedoms. After this, like most citizen soldiers, this veteran came home, put the war behind him, and went back to work, became a productive member of society, started a family, and began to live the American dream. The story actually goes deeper than the events I just told you about. Everyone likes to hear the heroics of the frontline soldier. Let us not forget in our fight for freedom, it is not only a soldier who carries the rifle and meets our enemy face to face, but equally as important is the support personnel who supply the beans and the bullets, which make it possible for these guys to do their job. Another huge factor was all the citizens on the home front the Rosie the Riveters, without whose support our, for our armed forces would not have made it possible for us as a country to prevail against the Axis forces. All these people collectively deserve just as much support and a depth of gratitude as does a rifleman on the front line. Remember, it's a team effort, which we are all part of the team, and it is our responsibility to support our service members. With our, without our support, they cannot do their job. Several years ago, I had the pleasure of an all-expense-paid trip to Iraq, paid in full by my Uncle Sam. And I might add, it was a delightful trip. All right, that was funny. <laughs> One of the things I noticed during my tour was the amount of support from back home. I cannot count the number of schools, churches, and individuals that would send us care packages, some small, some large. There was even a woman in the Northeast who would take orders for banana nut bread over the internet and send the home, cook, home cooked product to the service member who requested it. You cannot imagine how much this helped the soldier's morale, just being able to maintain contact with someone back home who cared. This was a huge morale booster. On my return back to Alabama, I was amazed by all the attention I was given as a returning serviceman. I walked through the Atlanta airport with a group of soldiers en route to my connecting flight. Everyone in the terminal we were walking through stood up and applauded us. It actually gave me goosebumps to have this much attention directed towards us just for doing our job. Another time I was flying home and the stewardess realized excuse me, I was just returning from Iraq. She must have advised the pilot as he announced over the intercom who I was and thanked me for my service. And with that, the whole plane erupted in applause. Wow, did I real feel really special and embarrassed. This is a far cry of how we treated some of our returning veterans during Vietnam. Hopefully, we've all learned something since then 
and will not make that mistake again. It is no difference today as it was some 80 years ago. Without our support, physically, mentally, and spiritually, our military service men and women cannot successfully accomplish their goals. Remember, the individual service member does not create the world's problems. He does not start wars. He's usually not even a politician. He takes orders, does his civic duty, and thank God he does. We are all part of the big picture. Sometimes being a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine can be a lonesome job. You're away from home and family, sometimes with less than adequate living conditions, and usually all this with low pay and very little recognition. This Veterans Day and every day, let us not forget to thank our citizen soldiers, our veterans, and ourselves for allowing us to enjoy the freedoms we all take for granted that now, more than ever, seem to be constantly challenged. Our veterans and our servicemen and women should be our heroes for what they do and who they are. They set a hell of a high standard for all of us to aspire to. And by the way, my hero is a man in this story. And if you've not guessed it, this was my father. For all of our vets, for all of our vets, all of our vets, 